I make and sell engineered organisms. Please, well, please welcome to the stage, Patrick Boyle. Thank you. So I'm Patrick. Uh, I lead the design group at Ginkgo Bioworks. Um, we are a synthetic biology company, um, and we use hardware and software automation um, to design microbes. So I want to talk a little bit about how we do that and, and how that actually works. You know, a lot of people see robots and biology and wonder how those go together. And how does biology uh, go into the food that we eat? So I'd like to talk about that as well. Um, but first, I wanted to show this slide and kind of talk about why um, why we're interested in engineering biology, why we find biology to be so fascinating. Um, so I like to look at this slide and think of what is the most powerful piece of technology um, on this slide. And if you ask me, I would say that it's the, the plant. Um, you know, the plant uh, makes all of these complex structures from CO2 and sunlight. Right, um, which is uh, continually fascinating to me. The more I learn about biology, the more I'm learning, you know, how complex it is um, and how amazing it is. Um, and it turns out, you know, biology is, is self-replicating. It makes copies of itself. Um, it's self-repairing. Um, it'd be nice if our electronics could do that. Um, and it's also self-assembling. Um, from a seed, you can make, you know, a sequoia, a large tree. Um, and all of the things that happen in a biological system are patterned with atomic precision. Um, so when we think about, about biology and technology, we, we realize a lot of the properties that we really like about technology and what we'd like to make better about technology are already things that uh, biology has invented for us um, you know, before humans even came along. So you know, obviously, uh, the things that we eat influence our nutrition and our health. Um, biology has invented light-sensitive film and sensors. Um, sensors are interesting. You know, biology has to sense and respond to its environment. Um, so the human nose is an incredibly powerful sensor. Um, Things like data storage, uh, you know, all the instructions required to make a human, there are trillions of copies of that within, within your body. Um, so you know, I could go on and on about biology, but, but really, biology is, is a technology platform. Um, we also like to say that, that biology is nanotechnology that actually works. Um, you know, if you think about what, what happens uh, you know, inside cells, this is a, you know, a vesicle walking along a, a microtubule. These are things that are happening uh, thousands of times every second in every cell in your body. Um, and again, being able to uh, make renewable resources and renewable uh, um, products with biology is something that biology just does by itself. And if we learn how to um, engineer products that take advantage of that, then we can also make renewable resources with biology. And most importantly for, for me and, and the reason I have a job um, is that, that we believe that biology is, is programmable um, because all of this stuff is really interesting, but if we weren't able to actually program biology, we'd just be, be observers. But you know, because we know about DNA and genetics, uh, we can actually start to program biology um, and make new products with biology. So, uh, you know, at Ginkgo Bioworks, uh, we like to think of ourselves as, um, as focusing on, on the, the part that's hardest uh, right now, and that's engineering the microbe. Um, so there's a whole ecosystem, um, as we've heard today, of, of fermentation and, and fermented products. Um, we focus instead on applying uh, technology to engineering microbes that fit into fermentation processes. Um, so we work with our, our customers to figure out um, ingredients or products that they want to make. Uh, we decide if we can design a microbe that produces that, um, and then uh, when we make that microbe, we license it back to our, our customer who uses it to make that product. So, um, you know, we're a long way from here, but I like to think of, you know, the same way that Intel um, produces chips for many different industries. We see microbes as, you know, chips, components um, that we can uh, provide to our customers to make uh, uh, many, many different products. And, you know, I'm going to talk about ingredients today, so flavors and fragrances and other uh, products. Um, but, you know, really everywhere that you see biology is, is a place where, where engineering microbes could, could play a role. We learned about um, the microbiology of the built environment uh, earlier, earlier this morning, and, and really there are microbes um, everywhere, biology is everywhere. So I, I think there are a lot of uh, other areas beyond um, uh, ingredients that, that biology will take us. Um, so what we do at, at Ginkgo is we work with microbes, so yeast and bacteria, um, and, and use that to produce uh, different cultured, uh, cultured ingredients. Uh, this is just a photo of some of the, the strains that, uh, that we've been working on. Um, and if you want to read about us, there are a lot of uh, places that you can, that you can uh, read about us. Um, 
uh, I like this uh, next headline the most in terms of uh, when I saw that headline in Wired, there's an article actually about, about Ginkgo, and I saw that, you know, Johnny Ive is one of my, my heroes, so that was, uh, I should have just retired after that came out, but, um, but there's really a lot of interesting stuff happening where, um, you know, we can, we can actually design with, with biology, and I want to talk about uh, today is uh, how we actually do that, uh, do that design. Um, but, but Ginkgo is a commercial company. Um, our customers, uh, we have customers all over the world. Um, because of the use of automation and, and scalable technology platforms, with a relatively small company, we're able to work on over 30 different ingredients uh, with more than 10 different customers. Um, some of them you may recognize. Uh, uh, particularly, uh, we have a, uh, a collaboration with Ajinomoto where we're um, developing uh, new microbes together. So, how do you actually program biology? Because you know that's that's probably the most important part of, of all of this. Well, so Ginkgo started um, uh, with this gentleman, Tom Knight, uh, uh, who is an electrical engineer by training. So he spent 30 years at MIT. He actually showed up um, as a high school student and didn't leave until he had his own lab in the uh, in the uh, CCL department at MIT uh, in, in computer science. So he's a he's a, a, a really strong uh, electrical engineer. He was. Uh, you know, involved in the early days of, of developing PDB computing and bitmap displays, um, and he kind of got bored of that. Sometime in the, in the mid-90s, he said, you know, I see where uh, consumer technology is going. I see that um, electronics and computers are, are scaling in this incredible way, um, and that's really cool, but I want to be involved in the fundamental, uh, in fundamental engineering again. So he decided to say, what is the, what is the next technology that's going to scale the same way that computers have. Um, and he decided this was, was biology um, for many of the same reasons that I highlighted uh, just now, um, particularly the fact that you could, uh, that you could program it was, was something that he was really interested in. Um, what he found, though, was when he started studying biology, he took graduate biology classes at MIT as a professor, was that biology was actually really a craft process. Right? So like, I spent, uh, I did my, my PhD uh, in biology, and I spent most of my time uh, moving small amounts of liquid around by hand um, and writing down my results in a, in a lab notebook and trial by error of, by doing, designing one or two organisms at a time, and most of the time it didn't work. Um, Tom saw this and decided, you know, there's nothing fundamentally different about biology. It can be, can be engineered, so he started to research what are standardized parts in biology? What do standardized parts and design principles look like for biology? So he um, started to, to build his own uh, genetic repart parts repository, um, started standardizing a lot of the processes that, where everyone had a million different ways of doing the same thing, uh, and, and decided we're going to make biology and engineering uh, discipline. So today, um, he's working at Ginkgo full time, and, and Ginkgo is really a, a manifestation of, the, of this vision, is taking engineering principles and applying it to biology and seeing what we can actually design with that. Um, I do want to say that designing biology is really, uh, is really hard. Um, in, in fact, uh, you know, it's a little, little embarrassing to even say that we design biology because this is really what we do. Um, you know, biology is, uh, is, is really hard to, to understand and engineer, as anyone who's, who's worked with it knows. Um, so really what we're doing at Ginkgo is making thousands of crappy flying machines and trying to find the ones that actually, that actually work. Um, the thing is that, that that's also how flight um, evolved, right? So, so originally, uh, people tried many hundreds of different ideas for how to build flying machines. It took hundreds of years, but we eventually got there. So, you know, we're trying to, to extract some of these same principles, come up with thousands of crappy designs, throw away all the bad ones, and take forward the 10 that actually work, and take them apart and see if we actually uh, understand something about engineering biology after we do that. Um, but why, why now? So, you know, as we know, fermentation has been around as long as people have been around. Why is engineering biology now uh, uh, something that, that is uh, scalable and worth doing uh, versus 100 years ago or 100 years from now? So um, these are the, the technology curves that, that we really pay close attention to. Uh, I think you saw the sequencing curve earlier, um, but we also pay attention to DNA synthesis. So both um, DNA sequencing, so that's reading DNA, and DNA synthesis, that's uh, writing DNA, the cost of that process um, on a per base pair basis has been falling faster than Moore's Law for the last decade. Um, so it's just cheaper to do this stuff now. Um, and the other thing is that uh, because it's so cheap to sequence DNA, there's a massive, uh, a massive uh, uh, explosion in resources of genetic code on the internet um, that we can use to basically extract um, and create new designs from. So you know, every researcher going out and sequencing some soil or sequencing a plant, they upload that into public databases, and that becomes our parts repositories, all this new sequencing data. And because 
DNA synthesis is now so cheap, we can actually say, oh, these like thousand new genes that were discovered look pretty interesting. Let's synthesize them and test them in our lab. So the, the fact that this transaction of reading and writing DNA is affordable now has, has uh, vastly changed how we approach biology, and that makes this stuff possible now, whereas um, 10 years ago it wasn't possible. Um, when I started my, my grad school career, um, I got to synthesize five genes. Um, and it, was, it, it uh, was several thousand dollars, and we spent months trying to decide which genes to make. Um, today, a, a typical uh, uh, set of designs for us is a thousand genes. Um, and, and the fact that we've gone that far in you know, less than 10 years is, is a testament to how fast uh, this is changing. Um, so, you know, in the design group at, at Ginkgo, what we, what we do is we come up with uh, designs and then we instantiate them by synthesizing DNA. Uh, we do this by, by partnering with companies that are really, really good at DNA synthesis. Um, so through 2017, uh, at Ginkgo, we're working with 700 million base pairs of, of synthetic DNA. Um, to uh, put that into perspective, um, that's enough to write 58 yeast genomes entirely from scratch if you wanted to do that. Um, uh, if you wanted to write a human genome, it would, that would get you about 20% of the way there. Um, so it, it's one of these things where this sounds like a really big number, and it definitely is a really big number to me now. Um, but because of those, those uh, cost curves, I think it's going to be a laughably small amount uh, you know, years from now. So I think it, it's kind of, again, analogous to, uh, to computers, where um, you know, my first computer had a you know, one megabyte hard drive, right? Um, these things change quickly. So 700 uh, million base pairs now is not going to be a lot of DNA a few years from now. Um, again, we're, we're engineers at Ginkgo, so we, we try to uh, apply engineering principles to biology. So, um, you know, our labs um, don't look like traditional biology, lo biology labs. In fact, we don't call them labs, we call them foundries, and I'll explain what, what foundries do. Um, but this is just one example of where every, um, every piece of DNA, every sample that we handle in our foundry, um, comes with a 2D barcode. And if you scan that barcode, it goes to, um, it goes to our software system that tracks the, DNA sequ the sequence of the DNA in that tube, um, the quality control that's been done with it, and every experiment that's ever been performed on that design, right? So by having these relational databases tied to, um, tied to tracking all of these DNA designs, we can actually learn from that process and uh, make sure that when we're building these hundreds of crappy uh, flying machines that um, you know, we're, we're not making the same mistakes twice and we're always learning from that process. Um, so these are what our foundries look like. Um, so uh, this is BioWorks One, which is our first foundry. Um, uh, BioWorks One, again, is, is built around uh, uh, automation. It doesn't look like a molecular biology lab. Um, we just opened our, our second foundry, which is, which is BioWorks Two, um, which you'll see here. Um, taking a lot of the things that we learned from BioWorks One and scaling up the processes that worked um, and getting rid of the ones that, that didn't. So, you know, again, this is analogous to, um, uh, to chip foundries where when Intel moves to a new process, um, they don't reconfigure their existing foundry, they build a new foundry. Um, and BioWorks Two really uh, uh, takes and extends a lot of the processes that we like from BioWorks One um, and also features some process shrinks where we found something that uh, works well uh, in BioWorks One, but we could actually scale it up and make it better in BioWorks Two. Um, how do these founders actually work? So I, I said I lead the, the design group at, at Ginkgo. What does the design group actually do? Well, we're part of, of this organization called the Foundry. Um, uh, we work with uh, uh, three other groups uh, in the Foundry, and these, these groups are designed around what we think an engineering design cycle uh, in biology, what we think that cycle should look like. So there's design, build, test, and because we're working with microbes, a fermentation step where we can actually see if the resulting fermentation uh, works the way we, we think it should. But you know, this should be, should be familiar to any Anyone who works in works in engineering, where you want to design something, build it, see if it works, and if not, you go back to the uh, design stage again. Um, so the way you can think about that is that uh, design at Ginkgo is really taking ideas and turning that into DNA. So the, that 700 million base pairs that we're working with, uh, we're using those to create designs for our customers' projects, um, um, and then we, we uh, build those designs on the computer using bioinformatic tools to source um, different genes and parts from all these databases that exist out there, or even doing our own sequencing to find new parts. Um, when we come up with the set of designs that we think will work for this project, we place an order and we get synthetic DNA from our our customers in the mail. 
Um, the build team uh, does all the operations on physical DNA within the foundry. So DNA synthesis that, that we order shows up at our door. Um, the build team does assembly with that, so they build uh, bigger pieces of DNA with the DNA that they receive. They put that DNA into cells, and then they sequence those cells to make sure that the DNA we designed um, is, is being put into the cells and being boot up as, uh, booted up as we expect it to be. Um, the test team does all, all of our experiments. Um, uh, they're very heavily invested in mass spec technologies, which is another um, uh, technology curve that we've really taken advantage of in the foundry. And what they can do with that is measure all of the small molecules, all the metabolites, all the proteins, all the DNA, and all the RNA in our cells um, to look at thousands of prototypes and seeing if they're performing the way we expect them to. And again, you know, this doesn't look anything like a molecular biology lab. Rather than having a single person doing experiments at the bench, we're using uh, auto-sampling robots that can do these experiments much more precisely um, so that uh, you can actually make good comparisons. It's one of the things that um, you know, everyone thinks that they can do a lot more if you could do 1,000 of the same experiment. But if you do 1,000 things by hand, um, the variance between each, uh, each um, pipetting action that you're doing actually means that you can't compare a thousand things to each other. So having precision as well as accuracy is really important to doing these large scale experiments. Um, and finally, because you know, we're working with uh, microbes that produce products via fermentation, uh, we have a fermentation team that uses, again, automation to uh, do more precise fermentation. So uh, this is just a, a video of one of our um, arrays of automated uh, bioreactors where we can look at, um, uh, basically do a classic fermentation. You can make sake in these, uh, in these devices if you wanted to, but by having a lot of online analysis about um, what's changing in these, in these vessels as we grow them. And that allows us to refine the process and make sure that we can actually take those microbes and make useful stuff with them. Um, because we are engineers and because we have all of the software that's tracking all of our robotic um, operations, um, you know, we're always tracking how many operations are we doing in the foundry and are we getting better. Um, and you can see um, that, that uh, inflection point from 2015 to 2016 uh, represents when we brought Bioworks 1 online. And one of the really awesome things about foundries and the reason that we're really excited about bringing automation to biology is that you see that you know, this, this big jump in productivity um, didn't come with uh, you know, scaling or headcount 10x. What happened is that we, we finally got all the right pieces of the technology together, um, figured out that if we could get these, uh, these things working with a relatively small company, we can leverage automation uh, to, to gain these inflection points and really accelerate the way that we do work. Um, so this, this, uh, this chart actually doesn't represent um, uh, Bioworks 2 coming online, which we'll see over the next year whether we get that same productivity increase. Um, so Bioworks 2 is twice as big as Bioworks 1, but we expect to see a, a much better improvement in, in scale than just 2x from that. Okay, so that's, that's the technology platform, that's the foundry. How do we actually do design in, in biology? That's a good question. So. At Ginkgo, we're using fermentative microbes as our chassis. That's what we build upon. So, um, you know, our customers uh, uh, provide us uh, strains to work with, or we go out and grab um, a yeast strain and, 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 engineer, and engineer it. So, um, so the, the strains actually do most of the work for us. Um, um, as you've seen from, uh, from the earlier presentations, if you take a microbe and put it in a tank, it does a lot of stuff um, on its own. What we want to do is take those fermentative microbes, um, source new parts from nature, put those into those microbes, and confer those microbes with new capabilities. So the question becomes, how do we find genetic parts in nature? I mentioned that we have all this DNA synthesis to work with, that's raw material, but how do we actually pick the right thousand genes to work with? Because there are millions and millions of gene sequences out there. You could synthesize genes forever and never come, on, come across the right um, genetic parts if you didn't know what you're doing. Um, so we take a, a advantage of, of kind of inherent property of biology, um, which you'll see from, from these two images. So if you look at um, these images, these are two versions of the tree of life. Um, the one on the left was drawn in the 1800s by, by Ernst Haeckel. Um, and then the one on the right is, is one of the most modern trees of life that we currently have um, uh, being sourced from DNA sequencing data. And you can see that the art styles have changed a little bit. There's a lot more information on the more modern graph. But uh, you know, a single point remains uh, from both of these graphs, which is that biology evolved once. It came from a common ancestor. So you know, all life on Earth um, uh, is related from you know, a, single, a single common ancestor uh, that everything evolved from. So how do we use that to find genetic parts? 
Um, so a lot of what we're doing is designing metabolism. So you know, when you when you eat something, your your body metabolizes that food and does stuff with it, right? Um, so this is a map of all of metabolism. This is uh, every dot on this graph is a metabolite that some living thing makes. Right, so so um, everything that's highlighted here is a metabolite that a plant can make, and we know that um, plants are very good chemists. They make a lot of the interesting products that we like. So you'll see that this graph is is almost entirely lit up. So like almost all of the things that um, life can make, a, a plant somewhere can make it. Um, this next slide. Um, I've just highlighted the things that corn can make. So you can see that corn doesn't make everything that all plants make, but it still makes a lot of stuff, which is interesting because we don't associate corn as being something that has you know, a, lot of, a lot of fragrance or a lot of, a lot of variety in terms of flavor. So finally, uh, this is the metabolic network of yeast. So you see that um, even though the, the graph is now not entirely lit up, all the major highways of metabolism that were present in those plants um, are still present in yeast. So a lot of the work that we're doing, because biology evolved from a common ancestor, we can take advantage of all the commonalities of metabolism and start with something like yeast that it looks nothing like a plant, but say this, uh, this yeast highway of metabolism is very close to something that we need to make from a plant and basically connect the dots to get us to the product that we need to make. Um, so using these similarities and in all these evolved sequences allows us to uh, more smartly choose which, which genetic parts to try out um, because of this evolutionary um, uh, relationship. So, uh, you know, when you look at a graph like this, this is an example of how foundries allow us to explore diversity uh, via DNA synthesis. So this is a, a graph that we generated of a set of genetic parts that we're interested in testing. Um, so there are thousands of, of dots on this graph. Um, the connections between them are based on a bioinformatic model that we generated to try and figure out which things are related to each other on this graph. Um, so you can see on the left side, in the upper left-hand corner, um, is kind of the, the known neighborhood for this particular genetic activity that we wanted to work with. Um, but based on our models, we, we surmise that some of these other clusters, even though they, they look quite different, could also have that activity that we're looking for. Um, so you know, traditionally, if I was doing this in grad school and I could only make five genes, I'd never find those other, those other parts. Um, but in this case, because we were able to synthesize 1,000 genes, we were able to go very far away um, uh, in, in sequence space to identify these other um, interesting clusters that, that may have that activity. And you can see uh, the cluster in the kind of upper right of there is, is one of those examples where even though it's not uh, very closely, uh, closely related to the uh, genetic cluster that we started with, um, it's lit up with activity. So, so green and red dots there are things that ended up being more active than the things that we were starting with. Um, and you just never find that if you didn't have access to large-scale DNA synthesis. So you know, this is a, a, an example of where even though we're not doing uh, strict forward design as you would in, in terms of like building a bridge or building a car. Um, we're taking advantage of the inherent properties of biology to identify new engineering principles, right? You wouldn't build a car by um, grabbing a thousand parts from a random bin and, and putting them in a car and see if that works, but in biology you can actually do that because of these relationships. Um, so I want to bring back this example that I showed earlier of the uh, crappy flying machines. Um, and I wanted to add a little bit more uh, uh, more nuance to that in that we're not just making random designs when we're working the foundry, right? That wouldn't be very productive. Um, year over year, we wouldn't get better at that process. Um, and it turns out that we didn't just build random designs when we were inventing flight either. So um, one, of the, one of the key insights that the Wright brothers had um, uh, wasn't just that they were making a lot of prototypes, and they definitely did make many, many prototypes before they made the first airplane. Um, what they realized is that what they needed was a way to refine which prototypes worked better than the previous ones. So the Wright brothers invented the airplane, but before they invented the airplane, they actually invented the wind tunnel, which was um, actually extremely important uh, in terms of making sure that their designs were getting better over time. So they built scale models and tested them in this wind tunnel to make sure that, you know, did this change to a wing design actually improve lift characteristics? Um, is this propeller more efficient at, at moving this airplane forward? And they did this by using the wind tunnel to build scale models. So, you know, in addition to being a rapid prototyping facility, I like to think of foundries as wind tunnels where um, we're refining these thousands of designs over time so that each new project becomes faster um, and more predictable, and over time you get an engineering discipline out of that. Um, this graph at the bottom is, is just another example of, of looking at thousands of prototypes for a given um, genetic activity. You can see most of the designs that we tried in this experiment failed, right? So, so about two-thirds of this, uh, of this graph show things that show absolutely no activity. 
But on the right side, we have this 30% of things that, that all have varying levels of, of activity that, can, that we can quantify, figure out what's similar between all of those different designs, and then take those designs forward. So, so this, is, this is our example of using large-scale biology as a wind tunnel for refining, uh, for refining our designs. So that's how the foundry works. That's how these uh, design cycles work. Um, you know, it's, it's drawn here as a very clean kind of linear, uh, linear progression. But in reality, um, there, are, there are many, many cycles of, of trial and error that need to be done uh, to refine these designs. So we go through a design build test cycle, figure out what worked, take the best designs forward, go back to the design stage. Um, as, as we get better and, and better at building these, these organisms, then they start to go to the fermentation stage as we decide uh, we're actually close enough to start, start trying to ferment these these organisms. But, you know, it's something where, you know, it's certainly very, very messy at first, but as we, as we refine our approaches, we'll get, get better and faster at doing this. And um, because we have all this software to track all of our successes and failures, uh, we think that we'll, we'll um, uh, refine this process much faster than you would um, uh, working as traditional biologists have by themselves at the bench, writing things down um, in paper notebooks. Um, so uh, this is where we are today. We're, we're um, engineering organisms to produce uh, flavors and, and fragrances. Um, um, of course, we know that organisms can make uh, many other things, and we're hearing about a lot of that today. Um, you know, I'd like to think about where where is this taking us? Um, you know, biology is really, really... Um, when you think about biology, you think about, about food. And I think um, one of the things I find, find interesting is that um, people have always experimented with food and tried to create new flavors, new, new food products. Um, you know, this is just an example of all the different colors of, of, of carrots that, um, um, that have been bred or discovered. Um, so, you know, I, I think moving forward, the, the fact that we're learning more and more about engineering biology means that we'll be able to continue this tradition of, of making new, new flavors and foods. And I think that's one of the more uh, powerful applications of biology is going to be customizing and creating new, new flavors and foods uh, with that. And of course, uh, you know, I talked a lot about fermentation today um, and, and many of the talks at this conference are about fermentation, but there's a lot more... Uh, many more ways to make food than, than just putting things in a, uh, in a fermenter, right? Um, so cheese is, is one example of that. Natto is another example of that. And I think, um, you know, as we get better and better at, at doing this process, I think the, the areas of, of food um, that we can reach with, with, um, with engineered biology, um, I think it's going to get really interesting in the next, uh, next few years. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll say thank you for, for listening, and uh, uh, yeah, really glad to be here. This is one of the um, most interesting conferences I've been to in, in a long time. I'm looking forward to trying some uh, natto and sake later, so thank you. Wow, all right. Thanks.